And now I am um, very honored to introduce Hussein Falaki and Dr. Hussein. Um, and uh, he did his uh, master's at uh, the University of Waterloo. He graduated with his PhD from UCLA uh, in 2012. He then did a short stint at uh, Apple as a data scientist and then was the first software developer at Databricks where he's been there for over seven years. Um, he's done some great stuff. He integrated uh, Sparkly R into Databricks and now he's here today to talk to us about his topic. Um, so I'll let him introduce that. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, and um, since I have two monitors, please um, uh, let me know if I if things don't get through. So, yep, that's the right one. All righty. So now I'm gonna try and see if I can still. You guys see the slides now? Yes. Okay. So that's yeah. I just wanted to see if, what happens if I switch to full screen. All right. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Um, and thanks for the intro, John. I had promised to give a meetup talk. I don't, I don't remember how long ago anymore, but a couple of years ago at least. And finally, it's possible because uh, it's virtual. So today, I'm going to talk about one of the latest, one of the like uh, latest things we have been paying attention to and focusing on, and that is building data applications with Shiny. Um, so. Um, I, I realize a lot of the folks who are attending the meetup are, uh, you know, from academic background, you, you know, graduate students or undergraduate students or like, um, um, you know, uh, the, the meetup is being hosted by USC and there are folks from UCLA. So I'll try to give as much context as I can from the enterprise side. I, I do, uh, I, I think it would be pretty interesting to know that uh, these days R is, uh, has a Kind of an important role in industry as well as academia. So, uh, kind of an obligatory intro slide for my employer who is sponsoring my time here. I work at this uh, uh, company named Databricks, and the the mission of the company is building or offering a unified analytics platform that would accelerate innovation by. Uh, enabling data engineers, data scientists, and analysts all working in the same uh, framework. So they would collaborate with each other much, much easier. So, you know, and often the data scientist is using R and data engineer wants to use Python and the analyst wants to use Tableau and they end up getting siloed with their with different tools and it becomes very challenging and difficult uh, to collaborate and, and work with each other and share data. But we solve that problem by, by supporting all of these um, diverse languages and use cases in a single framework. So we're a very, we're, we're, we're a fairly large startup uh, when it comes to startups. We have, um, you know, uh, several thousand customers. This number on the slide might already be outdated and we have many partners and you know, Tableau, which John mentioned is going to have a training is like one of our partners. And um, we have uh, developed several uh, successful open source projects. Uh, you've probably heard of Apache Spark. <clears throat> this was uh, the, um, the original um, open source project that the founders of Databricks uh, did. And that's, you know, they started Databricks after they uh, developed Spark. We also um, introduced a new open source project called Delta Lake and a more recent one called MLflow. In this talk, I'm gonna touch on both Apache Spark and uh, Delta Lake. So um, a little bit about data apps in the industry. Um, so uh, kind of a show of hands, uh, how many people here uh, have used or do use Shiny? Okay, so there are a couple of people, um, like more than a couple of people, and um, majority haven't used Shiny. Shiny uh, is uh, like a, you know, basically very popular package, probably the most popular package for building data apps. So what is a data app? Um, you might be familiar with BI tools for building dashboards. And um, 
sorry. And uh, BI tools are um, very common and uh, very talked about in industry. All enterprises and the vendors focus on BI tools because they have a very large addressable market and they're more um, manageable. The reason is with a BI tool, you're interacting with the data through SQL, which is a declarative language. And there are many opportunities for optimization and data management when, when, when your data interface is you know, declarative and simple like SQL. However, when you talk to data scientists and R users at you know, various enterprise companies, they prefer to build their dashboards by writing code rather than like dragging and dropping you know, widgets uh, in a BI tool. Um, there are many reasons for it. They mentioned the fact that they want to be able to access data in, you know, um, um, in any way they wish. They don't want to be restricted to SQL. They want to be able to use third-party packages. They want to run a regression analysis or ElasticNet and um, you know, random forest. A lot of these things uh, aren't as accessible in BI tools. Um, they, you, when you're writing code, you can have non-trivial data manipulation. You can massage your data in any way you wish. And uh, when you write code to build a dashboard, you have much more control over the layout and the placement and ultimate details. You can even like use CSS to style things. And uh, finally, um, as a data scientist, when uh, you're doing data analysis, doing the exploration phase, you're building some plots, you're like, you know, summarizing data in various ways. And with things like Shiny, it's very natural and easy to just take your existing analysis and making it a, making it a dashboard. So the transition from the EDA to presentation is natural with something like Shiny. And all of these uh, make Shiny the most popular framework for, uh, for data, building data applications among data scientists and our users. By the way, if there are any questions, please uh, stop me you know, and, and ask your question. I want to keep it interactive. So um, now here, here comes the, the challenge. Bigger companies um, all have big data and th their data is growing pretty fast. This is very common quote when I talk to team, data teams or data scientists at various companies is our data grew beyond our initial assumptions. Um, it grows exponentially. Um, and it's a good thing if you can handle it and manage it because there's a lot of potential value in, in, in your data. So the more you have of it, the, the better. But at the same time, you have to deal with the challenges. So that's the, the size of the data that is growing. Big data also has other aspects. The, you, the, the qualities of your data also change with big data. Your data schema changes. Um, there are additional or new streams of data every once in a while. You have to incorporate them. They come from different sources. Their dimensions of your data can change. And you know, the use cases of, of the data um, grow and, and change as well. So you know, one day you're the only consumer of this table, and the next day a new team or a new person joins the existing team, and now you're you know doing multiple other um, uses of the same data. So um, even if all of these are easy. You constantly look for additional metadata to join and merge with your existing data to like increase the value you get from it. Like if you have, um, um, you know, you know, location data, you want to join it with county level boundaries and you know, produce better maps and things of that nature. So all of these make um, handling large data pretty challenging. And those challenges all apply to people who build shiny applications, especially people who, uh, after building these shiny applications, share them with the rest of their organization, with uh, other stakeholders within the company to consume the, their, their, their apps. So as a result, there's this very, very common architecture. It's a two-step architecture, two-stage architecture for building shiny apps. Uh, the first step is, and by the way, this is, when I, when, uh, this is pretty common in, in, in companies where there is large data. You know, when you don't have large data, you may not need to go through this. But the first step is running an ETL job or like a nightly job uh, to uh, extract data from your data lake or data warehouse 
and stage it into an intermediate location. And you usually perform either filtering or aggregation or sampling on the data from this large data warehouse or, or data lake uh, to make it accessible or manageable by your you know, single node R process uh, and shiny application. And then the second stage is you basically read from the disk or read from that local, uh, you know, the MySQL database or any other database, and you present it or analyze it in your shiny app. This is very common. Uh, it has some nice things and it also has some challenges. The nice thing about it is that if you already have a shiny app, you you don't need to make much changes to it. Uh, you know, previously you were reading some static CSV files. Now you're reading new CSV files that are being updated nightly by that ETL job. Okay. Now the the challenge is that now you have two data pipelines to maintain and manage. You know, both of them can you know have problems. If you change one, the other one might need to be updated as well. Um, some uh, in some cases the that staging uh, environment doesn't scale. So uh, you know, all of a sudden your data grows tenfold, and the sampling, the one percent sampling that you were doing before and was producing ten megabyte of data is now producing a hundred megabyte of data, and like you know, your application runs into problems. Um, also, uh, this is very common at, at companies that I talk to. The data governance or IT security might per, might not be happy with this uh, staging solution. One common pattern is they were um, doing everything in an on-prem data center, and they were happy with the two-stage solution. But now they're migrating to the cloud, and all of a sudden, it's not okay anymore to stage uh, intermediate data in a MySQL database in the cloud because it's not in an air gap data center anymore. So they, they can't do it. And so we at the database have been working with many data teams to streamline and unify their data pipeline using what we call the lake house pattern. So what is the lake house? The lake, lake house is what we call the, the best of both worlds. You get the, uh, the nice things or all the nice features from data warehouses, but you can directly operate on very low cost storage for data lakes. Um, so the nice features you want and you, you, you get that are available to data warehouses and databases are asset transactionality, you know, schema enforcement, good data governance, um, decoupling, but the nice things you get from the data lake is like you decouple from your storage, the compute and storage are decoupled. You basically don't need to maintain, you know, hundred machines running all the time in order to process the data. You only launch those machines or, you know, get those machines when you have a job to run. And when you shut down those machines, your data that is sitting on your, uh, cold storage is fine. Um, can I, can I ask you a question? Um, if you have your data in data lakes, um, how are you getting asset and um, schema enforcement? Yeah, that's this, that is exactly the, the secret sauce of this uh, project uh, called Delta Lake. Okay. Um, basically, with, um, you don't get asset um, with Spark on right. you know, uh, you know, DBFS or you know, S3 or uh, a blob storage. And there's this new uh, you know, component or project called Delta Lake that basically is a data, like at a very, very simple high level um, terms is uh, the storage component that you plug into the architecture and all of a sudden you can get as a transaction out with your Spark jobs. I, Same I, with schema enforcement. So you can actually specify guarantees and if data that comes in doesn't, um, doesn't um, uh, comply, it'll be put aside in like a, a temporary location and you'll be warned that, okay, I, I received some data that doesn't comply. Uh, I have one question. Uh, you know, normally, um, especially in company, the yeah. data is very confidential. So we cannot save the data, for example, like the lake house or outside the company warehouse. We only can use, for example, on our uh, laptop. Can for example, if I use my data on my laptop, can I continue use your programming? Uh, that's a kind of a bigger and much, you know, and, and a good question. It, it, there is no single answer to it. So it depends on a lot of things. 
Uh, I'm going to do a demo um, and I'll show you basically no data in, in, in the demo. Uh, I'll show you how you can use R and Shiny and your data wouldn't ever leave the environments of your, your, your company. So data confidentiality is actually great in that regard. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. So, um, you know, there's, uh, so there's, you know, support for many types of storage formats. Um, you can have very diverse types of data. For example, you can store images and process images, audio files, you know, semi-structured JSON data. And there is support for end-to-end -end streaming. Basically, you can have streaming jobs that are constantly dumping data into your data lake. And you can have support for very diverse types of workloads. One example of it is going to be you know, workloads from our applications. So there's a little bit of a background about this. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, so data warehouses are pretty old. Like they're, uh, uh, they have existed for more than 30 years and they're, they were great. So, um, you know, companies found that, you know, managing data is actually difficult. So they uh, built these sophisticated systems called the data warehouse that would take control of the data. And, and we're talking about analytics use cases where you're mostly concerned about like running a query or like, you know, aggregating and summarizing data for analytics purposes. So these data warehouses would manage data. Uh, you, you know, you, you would buy a big machine, you know, from IBM or from, um, from Oracle, or from Microsoft, and that has a proprietary software on it. And, um, and it has its own storage. It will, you, you send your data to this, you know, appliance. And then you can talk, you can ask questions about your data in, using SQL and they would offer transactionality and they would scale up very well. And there were later, there were distributed versions of these, which were very expensive. Um, the problem was as data grew and the amount of data grew, these became really, really expensive and became really hard to scale them. So the new pattern came along called data lake and the data lake was basically introduced with the whole Hadoop uh, innovation in the industry and people were saying, okay, we don't need to actually put everything into a data warehouse. We put a massive uh, distributed storage like HDFS or blob storage, and we just dump all the data into this lake. And when it comes to analyzing it, then we can just, you know, process, process the data. The problem with data lake is that it then loses on those nice features that, you know, your data warehouses were offering you. You don't get as much data governance. You don't get as much um, uh, you know, transactionality, you don't have schema enforcement. A lot of the nice things you, you had are now not accessible to you anymore. Uh, so now companies are having trouble using the data that they were putting into their data, uh, data lakes. So the project Delta Lake, along with Apache Spark together can offer all the nice things that you, you, you like about your data warehouse on the data that you've already stored in your data link. So that's, that's basically the power of this new architecture. And I'm going to be specifically showing an example of it at, from the perspective of an R user. So um, how does this shiny lake house look like? Uh, here I have data, you know, bits sitting in the, into a data lake, in this case, Delta Lake. And I have a Spark cluster. A Spark cluster is a number of machines uh, one of them is the master node or the driver node, and there are you know many workers or worker machines. And Spark is implemented in uh, in Scala, which is a JVM language. So basically, these are running uh, inside the JVM. And I also have an R process running on the master node of my Spark cluster, and I use either Spark R or Sparkly R to program the the Spark cluster. And um, you know, Spark along with Delta Lake would enable me to query massive amounts of data very conveniently. Any questions about Delta Lake or uh, or Apache Spark? Okay. Uh, sorry, Hussein. Uh, sorry, uh, can I ask a small question if you don't mind? Please. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, uh, Hussein, uh, I have also heard about Apache Ka Kafka. So, uh, is it similar to Apache Spark uh, when uh, processing streaming data? Uh, yeah, there's some similarities. Kafka specializes um, 
uh, on stream uh, streams. Um, and um, they're, they're not exactly uh, the same things. They don't address the same needs, but you can use Kafka from Spark. So Spark is a, is a computation engine. Um, and Kafka is basically a streaming uh, framework. You can do some computation in Kafka using its own variant of SQL. And you can also do streaming with Spark. So there's some overlap there, but uh, by and large, mm, they're targeting different use cases. Thank you so much. Cool. Okay, so now let me talk about Spark R and Sparkly R. These are two different packages, you know, very similar. They were developed to program Apache Spark for R users. So if you're an R user and you want to like talk to Spark, you don't need to go and you know learn Scala or Py or Python. You can do it from from R or using either of these two packages. They basically provide an API front end or like basically wrappers for Spark APIs. And they expose the Spark data frame concept. So Spark has this thing called data frames, which are basically tables. And um, you know the idea is basically stolen from R. Like when we were adding data frames to Spark, we were looking at R as a model example. So the, the, that's how it came to Spark. And both packages, Spark R and Sparkly R, provide convenient interoperability between you know, the R data frame stru data structure and Spark data frame data structure. So um, with these two packages, you get kind of the nice things that Spark offers, uh, which is, you know, a distributed, uh, you know, robust distributed, you know, based by robust, I mean, fault tolerant distributed processing engine that can uh, load data from many, many sources and can offer in-memory uh, computation. And you get the very nice things that R uh, offers to you. You know, you have a dynamic environment, it's very interactive, and you have a, access to a very large packages ecosystem, and you can you know visualize your results and um, basically all those things that you like about R. So you get you know, both of them. Um, so without um, any more high level uh, discussions, let me show you an example of a shiny application and show you how easy it is to use the uh, Delta Lake House. Basically, the, you know, it might seem very complex, but it's actually very, very easy to use. So here in this example, and I'm, I'm going to show you a simple demo as well. Here in this example, I'm basically importing the shiny package and I'm also importing the Spark R package and then start the Spark R session. Um, that basically connects my R process to the Spark uh, cluster. And after that, I can write my uh, Shiny uh, uh, dashboard or app. And here, notice that in my Shiny app, I am calling a Spark R function called read.df. And I specify the source of my data being Delta because I'm going to be reading a Delta table. And I give it the path to that Delta you know, data set. And that's it. Now I have access to a Spark R data frame. And Spark R data frames kind of mimic the APIs of R data frames. So for example, in this case, I'm calling uh, n row on my data frame, and it returns to me the number of rows in that data set. Now, it seems very, very simple, and it's supposed to be, but under the hood, what is actually happening is when I call n row on my data frame, the Spark workers will actually go to the storage, they will load all the data, and it'll count the number of records in a distributed fashion. So, you know, if I have a cluster of, with 100 workers, each of those workers is going to load a fraction of the data and count it. And then they're going to send those partial counts to the Spark master. And then the master is going to add them up and then return the results to, to my application in, inside the R, R process. So as a result, I could, you know, count the number of rows of petabytes of data uh, in within seconds, which is very impressive and kind of impossible without distributed computing. So any questions about this simple uh, toy example? So what would be a typical latency on a, like a petabyte type data set? I know it depends on the size of the cluster and stuff like that. Exactly. Usually shiny apps are quite interactive and Spark is not generally quite interactive. Yep, uh, yep. So mm, that's a great question. Um, and that's why using Delta here is the key. Uh, if you didn't use Delta, if I didn't use Delta, I would be dealing with um, much longer interaction times. But with Delta, 
It's much shorter because uh, it, it stores a lot of metadata about, about uh, data sets. So it performs um, some optimizations that, again, are common with data warehouses, like data skipping, you know, predicate pushdown, you know, Z order, and that kind of indexing. So you can actually perform, in, uh, you know, introduce an index uh, based on some of your columns. And if you, you know that you're going to be querying based on those columns a lot, and improve the latency of your Spark queries dramatically in, so that it actually you know, fits within the interactivity uh, tolerance range of your user. So I'm going to show you an example uh, mm -hmm. uh, like in a demo. So let me exit full screen here. So do you guys see my, uh, the various workspace? Yes. All right. So here I have uh, a notebook and uh, I'm attached to a cluster called Shiny Demo. Let me show you the list of clusters. I have a number of clusters running. I created one cluster called Shiny Demo. It has um, uh, 16 workers and one master and it's running this version of our runtime. And you know these are the instance types and, and I created it. So, Pretty simple way of like launching clusters very interactively, super easy. I just click here and then create a cluster. But anyway, I don't want to take time doing that. So I uh, wrote a simple notebook. Uh, if it's not readable, I can zoom in. Please tell me whether I need to zoom in or not. Can you make it a little bit bigger? Okay, sure. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So here I'm importing um, the, uh, the Spark R uh, package and creating my R session. So here I, um, you know, it just tells me to import it and some of the functions are being shadowed. Next thing I'm doing is just, you know, what I showed you, read DF and, um, you know, load the flights uh, data set. It's not the biggest data set, but it's pretty common to demo, you know, interaction with large data for, for R with the flights data set. So, you know, um, basically I am, dealing with 1.2 billion rows and it took me three three and a half seconds to count them so that goes to the question of like how long does it take to count them in this case because i'm using delta it's much you know it's, it's, it's really fast to count them the records because for each partition of my data delta is keeping statistics so it actually doesn't need to count each partition it just summarizes the statistics on the partitions um, so now, if I wanted to explore this data as a data scientist, I would, you know, you know, you know, I import my favorite package. We we're just talking in the breakout session. What is your favorite package? Make reader and ggplot. Both are some of my favorite packages. And here I am basically uh, filtering all the flights between SFO and JFK, and I'm grouping by year and the career, the, the the you know the airline, and I'm just counting. So a simple aggregation. Um, and here, this is the plot that I, I get to have, you know. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, the number of flights over time. And you can see the effect of 9-11 here. You know, there's a dip in the number of flights. So that's pretty cool, except that if I were to um, explore every pair of cities. This would take forever, and I will need to write code for every pair of cities. Also, I can't easily share this with my colleagues. I want to give them access to this. So, what am I going to do? Well, first of all, let me see how many pairs there are. Okay. Uh, so, here's another um, uh, 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 aggregation and filtering. So, I'm counting all the pairs of sources and destinations and filtering the ones that have more than. Um, 100,000 flights, and there are about 2,800 of such pairs of airports. That's a lot. Um, so I'm going to build a Shiny app for that. And this is the simple UI for my Shiny app. There's nothing special here. I'm importing Shiny and building like the simplest UI that has you know, an input selector for the origin airport and one for the destination airport. In order to help me pick the names of these, I'm presenting uh, everything in a data table. Now I write my server function. And in the server function is where I am going to first populate the data table. Next, I'm going to generate a plot. And that plot is going to use uh, the input uh, source and destination cities and then perform that 
um, aggregation and count. So over time and by the airline, how many flights do we have between that pair? So filter and aggregation. And then I'm just gonna generate a plot based on that data. So let's uh, define the server function. Now, all I do is just put them together in, in, a, in a shiny application. So here is my shiny application. So I started it. It tells me that my app is gonna be accessible at this URL and I click on it. And here's my uh, shiny app. So you can see that I have a table of everything. Let me pick a source city SFO and destination city LAX. And now my application is running a query and producing the plot to me. And you can see it's fairly interactive. Within seconds, I get I get the uh, I get the plot that I was looking for, and I can you know change it to let's say Las Vegas. I want to see if Las Vegas flights get got affected get affected by uh, did they get affected by 9/11? Doesn't seem uh, doesn't seem they got affected as much by 9/11 as like the, the flights between SFO and LAX did. So that's, you know, a simple shiny application that is um, directly accessing my data uh, uh, without having to go through an intermediate stage. Now, what I can do is I can take this URL and send it to my colleagues and they can play around with this data and it's running on the cluster directly and it's accessing and manipulating the data. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, uh, about that, the stability of that URL that it's generated? Uh, is it is it just getting updated every time I decide to run it in my notebook, or uh, yes. does that so, generate a new URL, or does it update the same URL? Yeah, great questions. Yeah, so this URL, uh, well, it has uh, two components. One is the the cluster that I'm running this notebook on, and the other one is the port that was picked by my notebook for this URL. So any of those two can change. So if I wanna fix the, this URL before I share it, one thing I gotta do is like uh, in my Shiny app, specify the port number. Um, and that will fix the port part. The second part is I wanna make sure that the cluster that I am running this on is gonna be stable. So for example, um, you know, I wanna make sure that cluster doesn't automatically terminate because there is a feature on Databricks that would kill your cluster or shut down your cluster if no one is using it. Or I want to make sure there is proper access control on that cluster so it doesn't um, get terminated by someone who doesn't have permission to do that. So there is a number of considerations for that. Um, and then, then I would have a, a, a stable Shenya. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So you're saying that cluster is running the... Mm if you don't terminate it, it's running the whole time and you're hosting your Shiny app there. And uh, the code would not be checked in to some version control? You don't need to. Uh, you can check it in. There is you know, integration with Git. You can check that code in, but because you're running it, writing it in a Databricks notebook, it's uh, persisted for you and you can come back to it anytime you want, even if your cluster has terminated, you can share that notebook with other people and they can like, clone it and they can do anything they want. They can run it on a different cluster. So you don't need to, that part is kind of managed by the, the, so, the, the software that is running in the cloud. Um, so another question, uh, as data come in, like um, when we manage data for Shiny, maybe there's a daily update and it's only available after 8 a.m., things like that. Um, since this, this is hosted all the time on the cluster, um, so that wouldn't be possible, right? It, it's available as people get access to it. Uh, let me make sure I understand the question. So the, your data is updating all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And now um, what is the concern? Oh, so uh, before you mentioned the workflow, which is the workflow I use, I put data in a staging area and make it available to just the Shiny app. But uh, using this workflow, there is no such thing as staging area. So your data will be available as it's streaming in, as it come in. Yep. But the exactly. Shiny app will have access to that. So, yep. okay. So every just time, every time someone like, you know, access the Shiny app or changes the, the inputs, 
it would basically hit the, the raw data directly on Delta and get the latest data. So exactly. So that's why transactionality matters because your data is being streamed in, you know, it could be streamed in using Kafka or something else is being streamed in and persisted and saved into your da uh, data lake. And, and uh, you don't need to do anything to get the latest data, just, you know, just use it. Um, I, have, I have a quick question. Um, with regard to data breaks, are there tools or features available within the platform to help you diagnose if your uh, Shiny app is maybe running slow? An example would be if you changed an input and it takes a while to query. Um, I just was curious if there's any features or functionality within the platform to help you kind of to identify maybe what what could be the what could be the cause. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are some there are some ways to debug and find out what's going on. So here I can look at the Spark UI, and the Spark UI is like the the, the most powerful tool to di dig deep into what is going on in your Spark cluster. You know what's the timeline of the events. What um, you know you know. Let's look at this job, and I can look at um, the you know I can go look at the executors. Oh, there's, this one is not available anymore. This one. And, you know, I can look at the list of executors. It's loading. And I can see how much data was provided to each executor, how long it took. I can order them by, uh, let's see, you know, just order them by the amount of data that they got. Some executors got zero bytes, some got like 40 megabytes of data. I can see which ones failed, which ones took longer, and so on. So there's a number of ways to debug your, your Spark application. There's also this Shiny app is also going to like maybe run into problems or like have issues or, you know, um, you can send debug messages. So you can look at the driver logs. And in those, uh, anything you print in your Shiny app code, you know, here, uh, you know, standard out. Can 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 like basically see what your shiny, what whatever you printed in your shiny application. So I'm not doing any debugging messages here, but that's another way of debugging. And then there are other tools for like so, the the inefficiencies can come from Spark, which is the you know, distributed data engine, or it can come from your R process. And you can like first find out which one is the bottleneck, and then when we find out what is the bottleneck, you can use tools for that to investigate further. So if it's in Spark, you can use the Spark UI or other tools. Uh, if it or you know Ganglia and other tools to look at your cluster. If it's inside your R process, you can use any of the uh, you know packages for you know. There's a package by very famous package for R Studio for um, for debugging performance issues. I forget its name. Um, yeah, so you you can you're free to use those packages. Thank you so and one much. other thing I would say cool. is. Uh, sorry, is one of the thing is sometimes you want to debug interactively. Um, so um, uh, some people find it much easier to debug their Shiny app using our studio. So here uh, we have kind of our studio running on this cluster. I can log in. And this is and basically run my um, my shiny app interactively here just for debugging purposes or like for while I'm developing it and then you know optimize it and tune it and play around with various aspects of it and then when I am um, comfortable then take that code and then run it in a notebook and then share it with other people hi I have one question uh, just use the shiny apple to get a result and know I noticed actually the create dashboard is in the you are a uh, URL. Mm, so that's mean, for example, if I create a dashboard, I want to share with my customer, this customer, remote customer. So uh, he has no data. He has no any idea about our programming. So I want to share the dashboard. Needs one, they can uh, explore, uh, for example, how many year, which year in 2020, they has how many inquiries or something. So if I use this program and just create dashboard in URL, how can I share with my customer? So let me make sure I understand the question. You wrote your Shiny app and you just want to share that URL with your customer, right? 
Mm, your dashboard with the customer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that customer, well, the, whoever, that user needs to have access to your Databricks uh, workspace. So they need to log into Databricks and they need to uh, also have permission to run queries against that cluster. So there are two steps that they need to, the two conditions they need to satisfy. First, have uh, uh, be able to authenticate to you know have you know be able to authenticate the directions. Second, be authorized to run queries on that cluster. Uh, that that the issue is that they maybe have the database, but he has no any idea. For example, how to run the R, run this the uh, the you know the programming something. Because I just for example I have created the dashboard already, so I for example I just wish the customer can. Uh, use the, for example, the filter, uh, the, uh, you just use the, the picture, uh, the Las Vegas is, is, is kind of information. He want to explore it like this way, but he has no clue how to run this the R programming. Yeah, and that's the, that's the whole point of Shiny, right? You're not asking your users to run any code. They just play mm -hmm. around with these widgets and they get their results. Like that's the problem Shiny solves. I just noticed you create the dashboard is on the URL. So the URL, for example, I create this one dashboard on my desktop. The dashboard uh, yeah, only can be can shown on my yep. desktop, yep. but it cannot can show my it. customer desktop. Yep, absolutely. This is only possible because I'm doing it inside the cloud. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, I got it, thank you. Cool. So then a little bit about that. Basically, uh, this is a great segue into what we are dealing with. This is all running inside the cloud, and there's a lot of machinery in place that enables this. We have um, an, a cloud service that is interacting with AWS or Azure, or more recently we announced um, a Google Cloud Support. That is, you know, when I launch a cluster, goes and you know starts instances and configures them and makes them secure, and gives them access to your your, your data, and then we have this data engine or distributed data engine, which is comprised of Spark and uh, Delta Lake, both of them are like open source projects. You can you can download them and use them on your laptop, or you can download them and install them on your on-prem cluster. But we all we, we take care of like configuring them and tuning them and making sure they work with each other. Uh, and we think we're very good at it because we wrote them. And then finally, I'm using R and Shiny inside this notebook, which is the data science workspace. So it's very convenient to like import them. They're already pre-installed. Pre uh, just, you know, with the one command, I get, you know, my cluster uh, configuration up and running. And with one line of code, I, uh, you know, start talking to it from my R notebooks. And, you know, I can also do it from R Studio. So there's a lot that's going on. Um, and all of that is uh, kind of possible because there's a lot of engineering that has been done behind the scenes to offer that uh, you, you know notebook experience, uh, and that's basically what we do. That's 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 what we have been you know working on for uh, for several years and are offering now. That's the Databricks Unified Analytics platform. Uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any other questions. Um. This is this feels very similar to Snowflake, and um, how would you compare Delta Lake uh, to Snowflake? Sure. Yeah. I mean, just curious. Have you? Are you a user of Snowflake? Uh, previously, yes. Uh, Not. Do you know where and where are you using it? Uh, where you mean which company or what? What kind of? Uh, I mean, either. Yeah. I mean, if you, you know, if you can share the name of the company or what setting were you using it. Uh, we, I previously worked in an ad tech company and we, we basically built the lake in Snowflake. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so let me, uh, let me say, what, let me talk about what's the difference between, between this pattern and using Snowflake. Well, first is um, um, you notice that I was using Spark natively on my raw data, uh, Spark R natively in my So I was writing code to interact with my data. I didn't have to submit a SQL query. There was no SQL query involved. I'm using you know Spark VR or Spark R directly. Um, 
So that's uh, the that's the the the, the first uh, difference uh, from the perspective of the user. When I use Snowflake, I need to tr somehow translate that translate my request to a SQL query that get then gets to Snowflake data warehouse and it will execute it for me. So it's basically Snowflake is a uh, is uh, is a data warehouse, but it's in the cloud. Um, and so now there are other differences under the hood. So with Snowflake, they will manage your data. It's the, it's the, again, like a data warehouse, they hold your data and they will like optimize it and like put it in proprietary format for, for them to be able to uh, very quickly answer questions about the data when you send them a SQL query. Whereas in this pattern, we don't, you know, you know, Delta Lake or Databricks is not holding onto your data. Your data is in your data lake, which is in S3 or Azure Blob Storage or HDFS. And you're basically using Databricks to just very quickly query your data. So you own your data. You can at any time stop using Databricks and you still have your data in your, your bucket. Um, also, uh, you're, there's a little bit more freedom with, with this approach. Like you can, you know, uh, um, store images or you know unstructured data and still have access to it. Uh, with 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 a data warehouse, you know you you ingest your data and then the data you know you 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 can um, uh, there are some types that they support and then you have to use their API to ingest that data into their you know, managed environment. So that's like the high level differences between using Delta Lake versus uh, Snowflake. It boils down to the difference between. Um, you know, data lakes versus data warehouse. You get some advantages with the data warehouse, you get some advantages with, with data lake. With, uh, but with Delta, we're trying to like bring both best of both worlds into one place. Where do you find the most of the clients or customers that you work with? Do they tend to store their data like on Amazon or on uh you know, uh, Azure or what's the you tend to find in the marketplace that most people use for their data sources or data storage? Both, we are, we are available on both clouds. We have many, many customers on either cloud. And uh, I mean, they're, you know, you can look at the cloud uh, market share data um, that is available like uh, this open source data. I think AWS right now is, uh, has more customers but Azure is growing very fast. And you know we you know we kind of we are getting customers on on both of them. Did I answer your question? No, absolutely. And I guess my follow on to that would be: um, Have you seen kind of adoption in the uh, commercial space by you know companies of open source technologies for data lakes more so now than maybe other proprietary softwares? Uh, so. Let me uh, clarify or make sure I understand the question. Uh, what, like, what do you mean by proprietary software? Uh, well, oftentimes like security concerns of maybe using open source software, for example. I just was curious if what you that you've seen in the marketplace. I see. I see. So, so let me tell you a little bit. You know, give you the broad like a, a broader picture. You know, six or seven years ago, uh, uh, there were many many concerns. First, the biggest concern for big companies was that, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to give my data to a cloud provider. Uh, so they were perfectly happy with open source software. They were just not happy with, um, um, uh, you know, moving to the cloud. And yes, there were some companies that weren't even happy with open source software. They said, no, 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 no. I would only use open source software if there was a, uh, like a reputable vendor that would, you know, guarantee that, you know, if there is a security vulnerability with that open source software, there's a, Problem, they would answer my ticket and you know address it within this you know time frame. So there were both um, objections to to the whole paradigm. Moving forward, now you know you name it, the biggest companies you can imagine are now migrating to the cloud. So they realize that it's actually more secure and safer to run in the cloud than having their physical data center. That's a huge um, you know, wave uh, or shift in the industry. Right? Like everything is moving to the cloud. So that first concern went away. The second concern is whether should I, should I use open source or proprietary? Now the companies actually prefer open source because they say, okay, I'm now let's say migrating to Azure, but what happens if Azure pricing uh, you know, doesn't fit my needs anymore? Or you know, for example, they become very expensive or uh, 
uh, I, I end up having to migrate to AWS. Uh, how can I do that if I get tied into Azure specific technology or proprietary software or other proprietary software that's only available on Azure? So they actually prefer to use open source tools because then they say, okay, I can move from Azure to AWS and continue using the same API and the same tool. I don't need to like rewrite and redo everything again. So there's actually now preference for using open source. However, they still want it to be managed. And it's very rare for people to say, I want to use an open source tool and I want to manage it myself, like install it and like maintain it myself inside the cloud. They, you know, it's very uncommon. Now you basically find a company that offers, you know, software as a service. Uh, and then you, you basically buy subscription from them. And, you know, that's what we do. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. If there are no no other questions, I think John, you can take it back and uh, be happy to chat. Thank you very much. This was great, Hussein. Um, long time in coming. <laughs> Been trying to get you down here for years. Yeah. I really appreciate the talk. Yeah, it's an honor, and I really enjoyed it. It's, I think it's a very cool community. Our user groups are really cool. <laughs>